of photographs from a trip that I took to Japan earlier this year in May. And uh, this is uh, going to be sort of a, a combination uh, tutorial of sorts, I guess. I'll be talking about my editing uh, you know, process and workflow in Adobe Lightroom, which is the software you see here, but also a little bit of a travel log as I would like to uh, share with you some of uh, the things I saw and experienced uh, and enjoyed on this trip, which was an amazing trip. Um, one of um, my favorite trips I've ever taken. Um, I've done a couple of videos like this before in the past uh, for previous trips that I've taken, but uh, that was a long time ago. It's been quite some time since I did one, and uh, I've received a number of requests for more videos like that uh, over the intervening years, so I'm, I'm happy to do another, and perhaps more to the point, this was the topic that was voted for by this channel's supporters in the November Supporters Choice Polls. Uh, the uh, supporters of this channel on Patreon and on YouTube memberships at the Foos Row and Foos Row Da tiers get to vote in a poll every month to select the topic of a video that I will then make. Now, this is coming out in December, so I was a little bit late getting out, uh, you know, the November uh, supporter's choice uh, option or, you know, selection here, but uh, nevertheless, here it is, and uh, I'm excited, very glad to be doing it, and if you dear viewer or listener, are interested in supporting what I do here on this channel. If you have ever derived any relaxation or enjoyment from the content I create and would like to um, support the creation of more content like that, and also uh, enjoy some fun perks while you're at it, such as, you know, potentially voting uh, in a monthly poll uh, to have some say over the kind of content that I make here, please uh, consider checking out the links to my Patreon and YouTube memberships down below at the top of the video description. Alright, I've said my piece, that's my preamble, so uh, also worth noting uh, that um, I'm not going to be going through the entirety of my Japan trip in this video. Turns out it's a lot of photographs. I took about 3,000 photos, I think, and as I started going through them, I realized there was no way I could ever do it all in one video, so uh, I'm going to have to do this in, in multiple parts, at least if, if people are interested in having sort of a follow-up or several follow-ups to this video. Uh, but for today, for today, I am just going to be uh, focusing on the first part of the trip, which was spent in Tokyo. In Tokyo. And uh, we got there and spent about a week in Tokyo before uh, going to other parts of the country. And uh, so I've got, oh, let's see, about 20, not about 20, exactly 20 photos. Um, that I've selected that are just intended to show kind of a broad range of, you know, um, locations and just sort of textures and vibes from around Tokyo and, and specifically, I guess, some of the things I saw and did there. So, so uh, this shot here, the first one that I've picked, it's kind of nondescript, honestly. It doesn't show any specific thing, but it's very much a vibe shot. Um, and uh, it's a photo that I took um, shortly after I got off the train. Um, we flew into um, Narita Airport, which is actually a, a 
their ways uh, to the east of Tokyo, and then you take a train into the city. Um, and uh, so this was not long after we got off the train at uh, Ueno Station, I think is how it's pronounced. And um, I just liked it because it really gives a sense of just what the cityscape looks like around there and that feeling of just all, all this stuff kind of um, piled on top of one another and kind of jumping out at you. We've got just all these interesting colors and, and textures and things here. Like I love over here, we've got some Pokemon <laughs> on a, a big poster here. Uh, I guess an advertisement for Scarlet and Violet, it looks like. Um, and then over here we have these beautiful uh, lanterns, which I'm not actually quite sure what the significance of them is, but I saw them associated with um, temples, and um, uh, maybe they have some kind of religious significance, I'm not quite sure. But um, anyway, uh, and then you know, next to that we have this little, the world's end, the world end, pardon me, Irish pub. Uh, just a very narrow little place sandwiched in between, you know, it looks like a tempura place over here and, I don't know, some kind of soccer place. Anyway, it's just a lot of neat stuff. Um, and for whatever reason, it just kind of caught my attention as, a, as an interesting photo. And then, of course, you have these crowds of people um, crossing down here. So this guy on a bike, something about it just kind of works for me. So uh, let's see what we can do with it now straight out of the camera. Uh, it looks pretty dull, doesn't it? Um, and that's because uh, most of the photographs that you're going to see in today's video are um, in raw format. Raw format, which means there's very minimal uh, processing applied to them in the camera. Normally when you take a, a photo with, say, your smartphone or um, a, a basic point-and-shoot camera, you're getting uh, processed JPEGs out of the camera. And so there's a whole lot of automatic image processing that's applied to those photographs, like, um, you know, color enhancement, uh, noise reduction, uh, sharpening, all kinds of things like that. What the RAW format does is it leaves all of that up to you, the end user, uh, to do um, yourself manually, basically. And uh, so, again, out of the camera, they end up looking kind of flat and pretty dull and a little soft as well. Um, you might notice that it just doesn't really look that sharp or crisp. Um, for those wondering, the camera that I used um, for most of the photos you'll see here today anyway um, is the Sony uh, ZV-1, which uh, is actually the same camera I use for streaming. So if you've ever, uh, you know, been to one of my streams, uh, yeah, I just use it as a, as a streaming camera as well, but it's a great little camera, uh, compact thing with a, a fairly decent um, and sizable uh, image sensor on it. Uh, actually, the same sensor that's used in Sony's RX100 um, line of cameras, so quite high quality, and uh, it's capable of capturing really nice images. Um, but to to make them pop, we do have to spend a bit of time with them here in Lightroom. Um, and this is by choice, of course. You could just get fully processed JPEGs out of the camera. That's definitely an option, but I like to take the time to fiddle around with these photos after the fact myself. It's just uh, fun. I, it's a way for me to kind of relive 
I like to come over here and look at presets. Now, presets are quite powerful. Potentially, they can really change the uh, look and feel of a photograph, and they do all kinds of things. They adjust, um, you know, color and and curves and um, uh, exposure and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, you know, they're categorized into all these different different categories. These are just the default profiles that come with Lightroom, but uh, you can, of course, find others online. You can find free ones, or you can find paid ones. And yeah, they really change the, the flavor and the vibe of a photo. But one of the best pieces of advice that I was ever given regarding editing photos, especially travel photos, was from a friend of mine. And he said, you know, the best thing to do is to, like, pick a vibe, pick a, um, a style, and then apply that style consistently across a set of photos. So, uh, you know, like if you're traveling somewhere really warm, maybe you want a nice, warm, saturated style, and then that kind of applies across all your photos. And what that does is it it ties them all together, right, with a sort of visually consistent style, um, and helps them look like they're part of a whole. And, um, you know, and um, brings that those feelings, um, you know, that you want to emphasize uh, to the forefront. And um, this is a, a totally subjective choice, right? Like, there's no right or wrong with any of this. Um, and it's that's where some of the artistry comes in, I guess, uh, to this sort of thing. Because, you know, I think sometimes, at least for me, it's easy to get uh, caught up trying to render the most, like, realistic, quote-unquote, image possible, like, something that's as close as possible to what I saw with my eyes, I guess, but, A, that's impossible, because a camera sensor does not capture light and motion and, and these sorts of things the way human eyes do, <laughs> and B, that would result in fairly boring and unopinionated looking photos, and I think it's more interesting to have, you know, um, some sort of, uh, uh, what's the, you know, color, I guess, no, color is the wrong word, but like some sort of stylistic, uh, opinion in your pictures. Anyway, whatever, this is getting into the weeds, but I guess what I'm saying is, let's pick a profile and then let's apply that profile to each of the photos and then work from there. So, uh, again, I just have the default profiles here, but there's, there's a ton of them. Um, and I was looking at a few earlier and I, I kind of like, um, a couple in the travel category here. Now, some of these are pretty extreme, like, like travel one, I, I don't like the way that looks. That's that's weird um, to me. It's this odd cast. Um, travel 2, though. I kind of like what that's doing. That's off. That's on. That's off. That's on. It's, uh, it's definitely making some of the colors pop a bit. It's uh, lifting um, our blacks here. So if you watch like these really dark areas here, and we mouse over travel too, you can see it. It makes them less of a deep black and more of a kind of a gray. Um, and in doing so, it sort of reduces contrast a bit. Some people might not like that, but I think applied sparingly, it can actually look kind of nice. It gives sort of a filmic effect, right? It's like a lot of these profiles are sort of emulating a film in some ways. Um, so let's go with that as a starting point. Now, having done that, we can go and we can still tweak it to our heart's content, right? And again, a good place 
advice to start with that, um, I find, uh, is sometimes just coming over here and using the, the automatic, um, exposure and color adjustment button, which basically I think tries to kind of give you, um, a nice even swath across, um, the, uh, the range of exposures, or next, that's not the right terminology, I don't know what the right terminology is, but it, I think it tries to sort of automatically adjust the light and dark, like the dynamic range, I guess, of the photo to be as wide as possible while avoiding any clipping, like loss of detail in the dark parts of the photo or the really bright parts of the highlights, right? So let's just hit that button and see what it does for us. Okay, so, um, it didn't change too very much, right? We, um, exposure remained about the same. It bumped up the contrast a little bit, which I think does look nice. Um, what it did do was it really reduced our highlights, um, which, um, I find myself doing often anyway, because, um, when you take these photos, uh, there's a lot of information captured by the sensor, but, um, in the very brightest parts of the photos, that information tends to get, uh, lost and all kind of blown out in the highlights, but by really reducing those highlights here, um, what we can do is we can recover some of that information and get more detail in those really bright areas. That is especially useful for uh, pulling some detail out of um, bright skies. Um, and sometimes you can do that and just realize there's actually like clouds in the sky that you can see and you can get more drama and depth that way out of those, those very bright areas. Um, it's also done something similar, but opposite in the shadowed areas, which is boosted those shadows, so brightened the shadows, so we can see more detail in the shadowed parts of the image. It's kind of creating a high dynamic range scenario, right, where it's trying to get as much detail out of the really bright parts and the really dark parts of the image as possible by kind of smooshing those parts towards the center a bit more. Um, but it's still keeping the very far ends anchored uh, at the sort of very brightest and very darkest possible values. So it's not a crazy huge difference, but I do think that it's it's done some good stuff for the photo here. Um, in my opinion, uh, again, this is all pretty subjective. Also, I should probably point out that I am colorblind and that doesn't mean I can't see color at all, but it does mean I see color different than many other people. And uh, uh, there's particular colors that I'm somewhat deficient in. Red is definitely one of them. You know, I can see that this is red, but uh, um, some shades of red in certain contexts can be tough to see. Or, um, you know, the red components of other colors can be tough to see. Like sometimes purples and blues can look pretty similar. Greens and yellows can look pretty similar. Reds and greens can both look kind of brownish. It's hard to describe because I've never known anything else, but uh, that's my understanding. So, anyway. Um, man, I'm really getting into the weeds here with all this... Uh, Lightroom stuff, and less so about the actual trip. So let's let's just uh, kind of jump through this uh, and and keep moving on here because we've got a lot of photos to get through. So uh, it's also bumped up the vibrance, um, which is quite apparent with these bright, colorful signs and all that, and also some of the clothing now is really popping a lot. Um, the street sign <laughs> a lot, um, and and same with the saturation there. So that's fine. We'll we'll let that uh, we'll let that stay as is. Um, but uh, what we we really should do here is add a bit of sharpening, um, because again by default out of the camera these raw photos 
just a very soft look to them. So uh, there's a few ways we can do that. There's a little sharpening module over here where we can do things manually, but uh, oftentimes I like to just come over here and slap on some heavy sharpening as um, uh, provided as a preset here. And uh, that's done actually quite a bit already to uh, pull, um, you know, well, I was going to say pull detail out, but really it's just refined the detail that was already there by increasing local contrast um, amongst, uh, you know, along edges and stuff. But um, I do think it's an improvement and we can actually come back here and we can jump between the pre-sharpened, post-sharpened, pre-sharpened, post-sharpened. It might not look any different to you on the YouTube video because uh, you're going to be watching it at, well, I guess 4K, maybe. It depends on your screen, up to 4K. But um, also with YouTube's video compression, it's probably just not visible to you what... Uh, you know, the difference that that sharpening is making, but it's it's visible to me. Um, but in doing so, we've also made things a little bit noisier, uh, which is to say it looks a bit grittier. Maybe you can see, um, hopefully even on the YouTube video, that there's quite a bit of noise and grit in some parts of this image, especially the darker parts of the image. Um, but... You know, and there are things we can do about that. There's uh, manual denoising controls here, and also uh, a very powerful AI-based denoising, which is a pretty recent addition to uh, Lightroom Classic here, um, and it works really well. Actually, it's it's surprisingly good in most scenarios. But um, I don't think we need it here. If I'm being honest, um, like, yeah, there's noise in the image, but I kind of like a bit of noisiness, honestly, a bit of grittiness, because to me it, it makes it look a bit more filmic, like it's, it's kind of like a film grain, almost. Obviously that can be overdone, um, but in this case, it's just the natural noise of the sensor, and it, I think it actually looks better with a bit of noise if you remove it all. Sometimes it, it can look too flat or too like weirdly clean, uh, even to the point of getting a little smeary in some places. So I think we're just gonna leave it just as it is because I, I, I think the, the noise we have here is okay. Then one of the last things that I, I like to do is I like to add some vignetting to a lot of photographs and this is, a very stylistic choice on my part. Like, there's really no reason to add vignetting, but vignetting, if you're not familiar, is just this kind of shading or shadowing that comes in from the edges, you see? That's off, that's on, off, and on. And what it does is it provides these sort of gradients coming in from the edges. I, prov I, I find it provides um, drama to the image. Um, and it also draws your focus towards the center of the image rather than the edges. Now in this case, there's not actually that much going on in the center of the image, you know, it's it's fairly boring. A lot of the interesting stuff is actually kind of down here in the bottom third of the image. But I still think it, it, it does nice things for, I don't know, just the overall um, feeling of the image, I think, benefits from having, uh, some vignetting, so I'm just gonna go with the heavy vignetting option here. It, again, I, I don't know if I can really justify it, I just kind of like it. It does provide a bit of a gradient in this otherwise very uniform, bright bit of sky here. Um, and I just kind of like the way it looks. It just adds some drama. Um, so I think that I'm going to call that done. And like, truth be told, we didn't do that much here, really. Like, we kind of just applied a couple of profiles and hit a couple of, like, automatic adjustments. 
and then, you know, decided to throw some sharpening in a vignette on there. So, not a lot of, like, artistic, uh, um, you know, choices here, but still, um, I think it looks pretty decent. Um, and obviously, if you have a workflow that kind of goes through these few things, you can theoretically get through photos pretty quick, unless you want to go in and make more, you know, bespoke kind of modifications to a given photo, and sometimes you do, you know, but this one, it doesn't really feel like it needs much more, so um, I think we're going to leave that as is and move on to the next one, which is, oh yeah, okay, oh no, we skipped too far, for some reason I missed one there, oh yeah, this one's kind of fun, um, this is another one that's just sort of a a little slice of life photo uh, that I, I happened to take as we were um, walking from our hotel over towards uh, the Sensoji Temple. And um, I guess I feel a little bad because this lady, I don't know if she saw me taking this photo. Looks like she's smiling. I don't know if that was in response to something over there. This was like across the street from me. And I wasn't trying to be like a creeper or anything. <laughs> I was just, you know, just kind of shooting uh, um, pictures as I was just walking along. Uh, sort of anything that caught my eye. And, uh, but anyway, I don't know if she saw me taking that picture. And this is like an awkward smile. <laughs> Uh, like a nervous smile, or if she was just having a chat with somebody over there, you know, maybe inside this restaurant, I don't know. Anyway, whatever the case, I kind of like it. There's something about this photo that spoke to me, just in the composition, I guess. So, let's do what we did previously, and just let go through that, that workflow, and see how it comes out, and then we can make modifications from there if we want. So, uh, switch to camera standard profile. So that actually, yeah, that, that made a more substantial difference than I expected. Let's, I don't think this needs any straightening, but I'm just curious what it would do if we were to hit that. So it, you know, it tilts a little bit. I don't really know that that does anything for us. I'm going to probably just undo that so we can just step back in our history and uh, leave it as such. I don't think we really need to apply that straightening adjustment. Um, but from here, let's apply that TR2 filter. So our whites definitely get brighter. Our uh, darks get lifted. Some of our colors uh, get popped a little more. Um, but then we'll come over here and hit this auto, uh, auto tone button. Okay, that actually did a fair bit. Um, it, again, brightened things up a bit. Um, brought a lot more color out with the, uh, the vibrance and the saturation controls. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty nice. Um, and so if we come in and we just do what we did last time, we do some heavy sharpening. This photo is actually a little soft, not because of the uh, raw, um, you know, photo format, but actually because it's a slightly blurred. Um, you can see I, I was in motion. I think I was walking when I took this photo, and so there's just a little bit of motion blur to it, but not bad, not bad. So um, I think that's fine. And um, there, we put that vignetting in, and now suddenly suddenly it kind of pops, doesn't it? The vignetting really adds that nice drama, that shading over here on this vine. It helps draw the focus to the center of the image, which in this case is exactly where we want the focus to be. It's on this storefront and this this lady here. So um, in that sense, I think this works really, really well. Um, is there anything else that we want to do here? Well, if we did want to add a bit more, mm, not sharpness, but clarity, one might call it, to the image, uh, because it is a little soft because of that motion blur, 
and we can work on that a little bit with this clarity slider here. Um, this in basically increases local contrast, um, and you can really go, you can go way too far with this clarity slider, and it starts to look really weird. Like it gets this extremely strange, like high contrast kind of look. Some people might prefer that. Personally, I think it's best used sparingly, but if we bump that up to like around 10, that makes a difference. I think it does uh, just make the image pop a little bit more. So, uh, I think that looks pretty good. I think that's looking, that's looking solid. Not too much required there. Alright, so this is the one we accidentally skipped it to before. This is a fun image of the Tokyo Sky Tree, which is an enormous broadcast tower that you can actually go up and observe the city from. Ironically enough, we didn't end up getting up the Tokyo Sky Tree, so didn't have a chance to uh, you know, see the sights from on high, but we did get to see it from the ground, and I uh, couldn't resist this really neat framing, you know, right down the street here. Um, and, uh, you know, with this crosswalk down here, something about this composition just looks really nice to my eye. So let's just take it through the steps that we've done, we've done previously and then, uh, see where we, where we end up. Um, We'll come over here and we'll just, uh, now this could actually maybe benefit from a little bit of straightening. Mm, nope, that basically did nothing. I was going to say we want to make sure this tower is perfectly vertical because it's going to be very obvious if it's not. But in this case, I don't really see that it's necessary and uh, Lightroom seems to agree. So, the auto there. So that's actually brightened up uh, some of the shadows here a fair bit. Um, and it has taken um, uh, some of the highlights down, but let's take that even further. Let's just slam that right down. You can see that we are starting to get a little bit of character here in the sky once we reduce those highlights. And if we, um, once again, I'm just going to bump the clarity a tad, just a tad, right about there. And uh, let's... Let's throw on that sharpening and that vignetting. And now, now we really get that um, texture in the sky. We see that there are clouds up there. <laughs> uh, it's not just a you know, bright white sky. Um, that's, of course, the vignetting that's bringing that out. If we back that off, it's much less visible. We apply it, there it is. But again, it provides some really fun drama. And it, um, you know, it, it really draws the eye to the center of the image right down the street here, um, which is excellent, most excellent. That's what we want. So, um, I think that looks pretty good. <laughs> it's a little boring. We're, we're more or less making the same exact adjustments to each of these images, but that is how you get a nice, consistent style, right? Uh, that sort of uh, uh, ties all your, your images together. Again, this was on our walk to the Sensoji Temple uh, from our, our hotel. It's kind of neat. There's like a little... Uh, garden almost up here. I don't know if this is intentionally planted. It must be, I would think. And uh, lots of little shops and such along the way. And that big old Tokyo sky tree. It's hard to get a sense of the scale, but it's it's huge. It's quite a ways away from, uh, you know, from where I took this photo. And of course, you know, people, people going about their lives here. Um, there is another handy feature in Lightroom where you can press Y and it'll compare the, the before and the after of the picture so we can see what our, our edits have done here. And, uh, you know, certainly it's a lot less dull. The colors are popping more. There's more contrast. We have more detail in the sky and in the 
the shadows and uh, overall it's just in my opinion a much more interesting image to look at so always always fun to uh, do the little before and after comparison okay so now this is at the Sensoji temple complex which is uh, a beautiful and very famous temple complex um, in uh, Tokyo and uh, I could not tell you more about the history of it, of it off the top of my head because <laughs> I do not know um, but you can you know, look it up if you're curious um, but it's it's got uh, some really uh, really gorgeous buildings and I've got a couple of shots here um, from that uh, location um, this one I like because of the framing. I think it's just um, it's just really visually appealing. But there's not a whole lot going on in the image, like other than just the temple, right? Uh, this one I like because you get a sense of the the hustle and bustle going on here. This is a very popular tourist site, one of the top sites in the city, and so. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very busy, and uh, you get, you know, people from all over the world just uh, coming to to see this place, so um, I like the, the feeling that the crowd um, confers here as well. Pardon me, I'm trying to suppress a yawn. <laughs> I, uh, I'm quite tired. Uh, all right, so let's let's just go through our steps. Go through our steps and see how it looks. Camera standard. All right, that reduced the contrast a bit. You can see a little more detail in some of those shadows. A little more detail in the sky, I think. Uh, let's hit our TR2, which kind of undoes some of that work <laughs> of uh, getting a little more detail in the sky. Um, but uh, I think hitting our auto. Well, probably, oh, wow, that, that brought a lot of detail out in the shadows because you can see it uh, crank the shadows up here quite a bit. Um, one thing that I have noticed and that I have seen others say is that uh, this shadows control, it can look quite unnatural if you take it too far. Like, pardon me, <laughs> if we take it all the way up, like it starts to look really weird, right? Uh, this like weird false HDR thing. So uh, you do want to use it pretty sparingly, uh, I find. And uh, anything over like about 50 just starts to look very odd most of the time, pretty unnatural. Uh, but in the 30s, even into up to 40 or so, uh, it can do a lot to, to bring some detail out of those shadowed areas. So. And if we hit auto, it puts it at 43. I wouldn't want to take it any further than that, but as it is, I think that's all right. That's all right. Certainly already we've got a lot more visible in these shadowed areas, which is nice. Um, and some more in the sky as well. I think we should bring these highlights down even further. Boom, suddenly we got uh, all this cloud detail. And, um, you know, yeah, we've lost some of our highlights, but I think, I, you know, goodness me, I'm just gonna yawn my way through the rest of this video, apparently. Uh, I think we, um, we still have plenty of dynamic range here. Like, it doesn't look dull, necessarily, for having removed those highlights. Um, and, you know, we could use a bit of clarity if we wanted, uh, if we use too much, it's gonna look really, really, um, you know, um, uh, stark here, right? But a little bit does, does help us out. Let's, uh, say, yeah, 12, that looks all right. Um, and then I'm just gonna fall back on my old, my old habits, which is, uh, we're gonna throw on that sharpening just to, uh, really, you know, pull as much, Detail. I always want to use that terminology, but there's really, you know, the detail is there or it's not. Like it's, it's not where we, we can't create new 
uh, detail if it doesn't exist in the ori original images information, right? Um, but anyway, the sharpening does help it appear to be a little more contrasty and sharper. And then we've got uh, the old vignetting, which really helps us get a lot of fun um, texture in the sky there. And uh, I think that looks pretty nice. I might also bump up the entire exposure by like a notch or two. I feel like we've still got quite a bit of darkness in here. We could also lift those shadows a bit more, but I think, I think something like that's looking okay if we compare it to our original photo. Yeah, definitely we can see under those, those roofs quite a bit better. Uh, the colors are popping. The sky is much more interesting overall. I think it's looking all right. Let's move on. So this one, uh, okay, right off the bat, I think it needs a bit of straightening. So let's come over here, hit the auto straighten. Boom. That's going to be way better. We come in here. Okay. Now I almost feel like that took it too far the other way. So let's, let's back that off. Let's go back and let's hit that auto button again. And now let's see if we can maybe just use our own manual discretion to, to tip it a little more still. I think this line here ought to be level with this line. I think that'll look the best. So let's do this. And you notice when we do this, we get a much denser grid by which we can judge um, the straightness of our lines. And I think that's about what we want right there. Yeah, that's doing pretty good. And in doing so, what we've actually done is we've managed to cut off this, uh, there's like, well, you might not have noticed, but there's like a hand that was in the corner of our frame over here, but that's now been conveniently cropped out of the image by straightening it. So let's do our usual adjustments. Camera standard, TR2, and um, auto. Uh, tone. Okay, now that auto tone is doing some crazy stuff here. Uh, to me, this looks too bright. I would say this looks kind of overexposed. Um, you know, I'm sure Lightroom has its reasons for, for doing that, but, you know, it just is a little too much for me. So now we could definitely stand to, you know, have things be a bit brighter than, uh, than the original photo, which was probably a bit underexposed. But, um, yeah, I just didn't want to go quite as far as it was sort of suggesting. I don't think we need any clarity or anything here. We've already got a lot of contrast. It's a, a pretty poppy kind of photo. But, oh, I finished my yawn. But, uh, I am going to fall back on my old, uh, crutches, the heavy sharpening preset and the heavy vignetting preset. And look at that with that heavy vignetting preset. Suddenly, lots more drama in the sky there. Um, also, interestingly, it was shot at a pretty warm color temperature, but I feel like it could use even more. Like I feel like it could be a little bit warmer. Now, if we want to go a lot a bit warmer, that's all that way. Way too much. But if we back that off, then back that off. But bring that up. Let's say like there-ish, maybe. How does that compare to what we had previously? It was 6,100. And then 6,700. So yeah, we did warm that up a fair bit. Is that too much? Uh, maybe that's a little too much now that I'm comparing it to the previous shot or the unedited shot. Back that off just slightly. Now 6,500. There we go. That's looking pretty nice. I like that warmth because it really brings out the richness of the reds, in my opinion. Now, again, maybe that's just me compensating for my poor red vision, but whatever the case, I think it looks pretty decent here, so I think we're going to leave it at that. If we step back to the previous photo, though, I think we could use a little more warmth here as well. Now, this is getting into what I was talking about, you know, sort of picking 
and maintaining his style and trying to make it somewhat consistent from photo to photo. Could probably go even a little warmer on this. I don't want to go overboard, but yeah, that's pretty nice. Okay. Okay, so now uh, this is quite a bit later in the trip. Well, not quite a bit. This is the next day, I guess. Actually, no, this is the same day, right? Because we we uh, left our, um, you know, luggage at our hotel, even though we had checked out, but they were happy to hold on to it for us while we did some sightseeing in the area. We went to Sensoji Temple. We did some shopping, um, this big shopping district, kind of just south of there and west, with like lots and lots of little tourist shops and stuff and these open air malls. Um, and that was, that was a lot of fun. We went to our first, um, like, Gachapon arcade. And I got a little, uh, Pokemon, um, like, Gacha, um, what do you call it? Pod? I don't know. Got a little Fuecoco. Um, and, um, and we went to a puppy cafe, <laughs> which I'm not sure about the ethics of those things. I, it probably varies on a, you know, cafe to cafe basis, but... Uh, it was like, honestly felt like little gangs of dogs roving around in there. Like, they were, they were pretty aggressive about getting the food. If you took, you know, if there was food there that you could, uh, pay to feed them. And, um, anyway, it was, it was interesting. Like, I'm glad we did it, but I, I'm not sure that it was like a, a good, a feel good experience, I guess. Although there was one very, very cute dog, an older one. Um, whereas some of them were very aggressive, this older one just wanted to snuggle, just snuggle. So, um, anyway, um, but we ended up, uh, at the end of all that, uh, sightseeing, uh, jumping on the subway and heading south to the Akihabara, the Akihabara district, which is what you see here. Akihabara is essentially the the nerd district of Tokyo. Uh, it's where you find all the uh, video game stuff and all the anime stuff uh, and all the electronics stuff. Um, and uh, this was the first night that we were there. We just went for a wander around and I, I like this shot because it gets you know, the sense of those just all the bright lights and the neon and colors and stuff. Um, Akihabara was really cool, and there's a, a few more photos um, from that area in here. But let's let's do our our typical uh, options here. There we go. That's making this look very bright indeed. But uh, I think hitting the auto here will help with that. Yeah, there we go. That really brought down those highlights, so we can see more detail in these bright lights over here. Let's get as much as we can. Also lifted the shadows so we can just see things a little better in general. I think we can turn down the exposure a tad. It went a little too hard on that. Um, and, um, oh, what we can definitely benefit from here is an auto straighten, I think. Oh, apparently I lied. <laughs> I don't know. It, it seems unable to figure out if it should be any different, so we'll just leave it as is. Um, I guess this is pretty straight, isn't it? This line kind of right here, this predominant line. But let's just indiscriminately slap on some sharpening and some vignetting. And uh, again, if we, if we turn off that vignetting, there we are. If we turn it on, boom. Um, I don't know that it worked quite as well here as it did in some other shots, but I think that looks pretty decent overall. Maybe we can bring up that exposure one, one tick. Oops. Now that we've, uh, you know, brought in a little bit more, uh, sort of the darker, uh, edges with that vignette. Um, this black, uh, slider here can actually do some really handy stuff for kind of anchoring the low end of the photo. Um, if it's looking like it's kind of lacking depth or contrast or just feeling kind of washed out, bringing this down can go a long way, um, to improving that. Now, it does potentially introduce clipping in the black parts of the image, but, um, you know, if you lose 
this bit of shadow detail, crush some shadow detail, as they, as they say, um, you know, maybe that's not so bad, uh, it just depends on what, you know, what you're trying to show, I guess, so there's a fun Akihabara shot, um, so this was actually right near our hotel, which, um, was itself quite near to Akihabara, technically it was in the Akihabara district, but not right near all those, or not right in all those, uh, video game and anime shops, but, uh, about a five minute walk away. But one thing that I really loved about Tokyo was that juxtaposition of new and old, um, and that, you know, played out across the city in many, many places, but here, next to our hotel, there was a, a little, um, a shrine, I guess, um, just in the middle of the city, just, uh, stuck between some, some big, uh, you know, towering, um, hotels and, I guess, condos and stuff, and, um, uh, you can't really see it here, this, but this was a, a shrine to, um, some kind of tanuki, um, uh, and there were some very, very fun statues of tanuki scattered about this little area, um, and for those who maybe don't know, um, in Japanese folklore, uh, the tanuki, um, are, are tricksters, um, but they also have massive, massive testicles, like huge testicles, they, they carry around like a giant sack, um, and I, apparently that's where their luck comes from, or so I was told. I don't quite know what that's supposed to mean, but anyway, uh, so this was a fun, like, tanuki shrine, and, uh, this, this, this traditional looking structure was in that little green space, um, you know, you can see there are some trees about there, um, sort of wedged in there between all these big buildings. Uh, you can also see there was pouring rain, it was quite wet that day, you can see the raindrops here. So, yeah, let's just do our, our, oops, typical here, camera standard, TR2, auto,
floor through um, some of those blocks in Akihabara there. And it was, you know, it was quite a dreary day. It was pouring rain. You could see the puddles outside. And it actually kind of gave it a bit of like a cyberpunk vibe, you know. Um, just with the, the, all these little electronic shops and the, you know, the pouring rain. It was pretty fun. So, let's step through the standard procedure here. And now, you know, applying these things sort of indiscriminately, um, you know, could be detrimental in some cases. Like, as much as I say that applying a profile is a great way to ensure consistency of tone between the images, it can also result in sort of, it might not apply equally well to every image. So just slapping it on blindly maybe isn't always serving your images, uh, you know, the best, but um, I think it's okay here. I think it works. Uh, let's hit that auto. That definitely brings down some of those highlights. We get to see a little bit more detail up in here. Um, and uh, maybe it took a little too far there. And uh, definitely more color in here. It seems to really always like to pop that vibrance and saturation a bit when you hit that auto button. And then we slap on some sharpening to bring out the detail. There's lots of detail here that's looking pretty soft. There we go, definite improvement. And the vignetting gives us a pretty nice image before and after, before and after, definitely richer in the after. More contrasty, more colorful by a long shot. And just, yeah, more and more interesting image. And also totally consistent with our previous edits. So that's nice. Okay, this image needs some help. Um, and I, it's not a great photo, honestly, and I normally wouldn't include it in a photo set, but I wanted to include it here because this was taken in a shop in Akihabara called Super Potato. Super Potato, which is a very famous uh, vintage games shop in Akihabara, and it occupies uh, multiple floors of um, a building there. I think like four, maybe even five floors. Um, not huge square footage on each floor, but uh, it's quite vertical. Um, and but it's just packed full, packed full of vintage video game goodness. And you can just see so much stuff here. We got, you know, slimes from, uh, you know, Dragon Quest. We've got a uh, very angry looking Mario. I have no idea what he's saying. We've got Parappa over here. We've got Final Fantasy stuff. We've got Sonic stuff. we got uh, just a little bit of a gigantic Mario over here. Um, all kinds of vintage game consoles and television over here. Um, and Wario, just all kinds of fun stuff. Um, return to Zork down here. <laughs> Anyway, it turns out I didn't really get very many good images in there, which is a little bit uh, disappointing. But this one, I think, really gives a sense of just the clutter and just insanity of this sort of video game nirvana that they have there. So um, let's see what we can do with it. It might be hard to make it really worthwhile, but let's let's try. Let's try. We'll apply our typical stuff. Uh, I think this could maybe use a little straightening. Yeah, that looks better. Um, but the first thing, or the most notable thing to me, is that it's it's really warm, like really warm. So even though it says that the temperature uh, is actually pretty low in there, but uh, the color temperature, of course, is what I'm talking about. But let's let's bring that. Oh, that's too far. Far way too far, but um, that to me is looking less like sickly and pallid. It has this kind of sickly yellow to it. Um, this is, I think, a little bit, a little bit closer to what it actually might have looked like. Now, I, maybe the lighting might have actually been quite warm in there at the time. I don't specifically remember. 
remember, but it just it didn't it doesn't look quite right to me the way it was. This image also looked pretty overexposed, so let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do a bit of that. Maybe we can bump that now. What do you think? That's definitely looking a bit better. As before, we'll throw on that, um, that sharpening. This one also pretty noisy. Could maybe benefit from a bit of noise removal, but I'm not going to sweat it right now. And uh, there we go. Boom. I think that's looking better. I think it's looking quite a bit better. It's still not a phenomenal photograph, but it's a lot better than it was. So I'm happy with that for now. Okay, I've got a lot of indoor shots here that are not really showing the city, uh, but I had to share these ones, um, and this one in particular, because this was in a massive, massive department store of sorts, mostly like an electronics store, but it, it had a lot of other stuff too, called Yodobashi Camera, Yodobashi Camera. And uh, it is another very famous electronics store in Akihabara. And uh, it is insane. It is truly insane. Uh, just, it's an assault on the senses in there. In that uh, everywhere you go, everywhere you turn, it's just maximally dense with product and advertisements. And it's huge. It's like a massive department store. Each floor is enormous, but it's like eight floors stall or something like that or nine it's it's a lot um and uh this as you can see is the mechanical keyboard aisle well not just mechanical it's all kinds of keyboards but it did have mechanical keyboards uh from the likes of like ducky and uh plum and um i think there was a Vermillo i saw there um and a, and a bunch of others as well. Um, but there was just a ton of keyboards here. Uh, you can see a bunch more down here. This was a keyboard Nirvana. Um, but as, as fun as that was, I will say, I, I could not spend that long in Yodobashi camera because it just made me really anxious. I have never felt that kind of anxiety before. Uh, just the feeling of, it was almost like Part of it was a sense that you could easily get lost in there. It was like a, well, Warren is the wrong word. Like it, yeah, it spread it. Like, I don't know. It just is almost like claustrophobic in some ways. Um, anyway, if you ever end up uh, in Akihabara, definitely worth checking out Yodobashi Camera just for the spectacle, just to see what it's about. But just be warned that, yeah, it, it just sent my anxiety through the roof. Uh, it was just, it was a sensory overload. Maybe that was it. It was like sensory overload. Because not only was it like all the products and all the ads on every surface, but also there was a, uh, like a radio playing at all times, like uh, music and text coming over, or in voice, coming over the, the PA system. And... A lot of it was ads for Yodobashi camera. There was like a jingle that they kept singing over and over and over again. Uh, like uh, Yodobashi camera. Da -da 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 anyway, it, like I can't imagine working in a place like that. It would absolutely just destroy me. But worth witnessing. Worth witnessing. And for some folks, it maybe it's fantastic. Anyway, um, it was quite something. Oh, okay, so this is actually already pretty um, tweaked, and that is because this is not a raw image. This is actually an image out of my camera, or my, my phone camera, pardon me. Um, and it's, it's a JPEG, and it will have had all kinds of image processing applied to it already, so not a whole lot for us to do here uh, in post, but what we can do is just try and bring it more visually in line with what we've been doing. 
so we can apply that TR2 uh, profile to it. Um, we can then use the auto uh, uh, tone balance over here. Um, that brightens it up a lot, actually. Um, but if we throw in uh, that vignetting, uh, that then makes it look a little more reasonable again. I think I will bring that exposure down a notch. I don't like what it did there. Um, there's no reason to apply sharpening because there will have been a ton of sharpening already applied in the phone, uh, as well as uh, noise reduction, which is why some of this looks a little bit smeary, uh, especially up close. Um, but we, yeah, really don't have to go any further than what we've done here. It's just taking the original image and it's popping it a little bit more. Uh, this, this is the uh, Pokemon Center DX in uh, Ginza. I think that's how you pronounce that, that neighborhood. It's kind of an upscale um, part of Tokyo. Lots of fancy uh, retail to be had there. Uh, but the Pokemon Center was also there. And uh, I, again, I didn't really get a very good photo of the interior for whatever reason. I thought I did to get better pictures, but I guess not. But I wanted to include at least one picture for all of you because I know we've got a lot of Pokemon fans here. Um, this is also already... Um, you know, fairly processed image. This is out of my phone camera, so we'll just uh, do as we uh, as we have done here, and uh, you know, make a few minor adjustments, but nothing really significant. We, we didn't really do that much. It's really the vignetting is doing most of the heavy lifting there. I think that looks that looks fine. Um, it, uh, it was a neat place, lots of fun merchandise, you can see we've got like a Pikachu waffle maker here, or pancake maker, whatever, I don't know, uh, some chopsticks, I actually got a pair of these chopsticks, uh, they're kind of neat, you know, plates and bowls, and a million bajillion different, uh, plushies, I got one of these as well, it's a sleepy Pikachu, it's the cutest thing. And, uh, you might have seen it in the background of my videos or streams before. Um, but, um, it was a little smaller than I expected, actually. I have to admit, the Pokemon Center DX, I thought it was going to be a, a larger space, but it was just a fairly small, kind of single-floor retail situation, so. But they did pack in a lot of fun stuff. Okay, so this, this image, this might also be, uh, yeah, this is also out of my phone. There's very little actually for us to do with this image. It's already pretty good. Um, this was from a vampire cafe that we went to. Uh, you might know that Tokyo is famous for its themed cafes. There's all kinds of cafes, all kinds of themes, pretty much everything under the sun. This was a vampire cafe, uh, and Sarah really wanted to go there because she is all about that spooky life. Um, and who was I to say no? So, uh, we experienced the vampire cafe, and you know what? It was actually a lot of fun. They really played up, uh, the hamminess of it all. Um, our host and server was, was a really fun guy who, um, you know, really kind of, uh, bought into the whole being a vampire thing, and uh, the food wasn't bad either. It was definitely expensive for what it was, but it was it was fairly tasty. Um, and uh, Sarah's uh, meal came on fire, so that was pretty cool. They, you know, uh, lit it at the table. And um, uh, this is just kind of a dramatic shot of that. Very little for us to do here in post. We'll throw that vignetting on. Um, yeah, I mean, it kind of darkens up my beer a little bit here. <laughs> That's fine. Um, what if we hit that auto? Yeah, I don't think it actually looks any better, honestly. I think it's... Yeah, I think I'm just going to leave that be. I included that in here just because I wanted to shout out the Vampire Cafe. It was pretty fun. All right, so now uh, this is uh, in uh, a, a yet a different district of Tokyo. Um, I'm trying to remember the name Harajuku, I believe. Harajuku is the name of this area, and um, it's somewhere that we went because.
because uh, evidently it's it's very famous for its uh, Lolita fashion, and uh, Sarah's really into that. So we, we went over there and checked out a bunch of uh, shops selling all kinds of uh, very pretty and kawaii uh, dresses and, and clothing, lots of very, like, um, yeah, Lolita style stuff, which I, I'm not qualified to describe really, you just look it up, but um, everything from like what they call, as I understand it, uh, Sweet Lolita, which is like uh, lots of sort of pastels and um, kawaii stuff to like Dark Lolita, which is like a gothic kind of uh, spin on that style, to like uh, sort of like cyberpunk stuff and like uh, cottage gore and all kinds of stuff. But um, there's a famous street there. I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but uh, lots of fashion places along there and tons of crepe places. This is one of the great places there where I could not resist um, the uh, crepes that they, they were selling. So I did get one and um, they served them like this. This is obviously dessert crepe. This particular one was a blueberry cheesecake crepe. So there's a piece of cheesecake inside here with the whipped cream and the blueberry sauce drizzled on top. Oh my God. It was so, so good. It was so good. Uh, but this is yet another one, as you can see, uh, where it came out of the camera, the camera being my phone, looking pretty good. And we don't have much to do here, but I will throw on that TR2. That really does a lot with the color here in a good way, I think. We'll hit that auto. We will um, slap on that vignetting and bada bing bada boom I think we're done <laughs> that's all we're gonna do there didn't change it that much just just maybe a little bit more vivid but uh, these ones that come from my camera phone camera I should say really don't need much work okay now this um is um oh gosh uh get this right. This is Shibuya. Yeah, this is Shibuya Crossing, um, which is um, a fairly famous crossing as far as these things go because it, uh, it holds the dubious honor of evidently being the world's busiest uh, set of crosswalks. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty busy. Um, but it's this just absolutely bonkers busy uh, metropolitan square surrounded by these huge glass towers, you know, um, and uh, it's got that, like, um, diagonal crosswalk, um, you know, you might have seen it before, it's commonly used in, like, stock footage of, uh, you know, Tokyo and that sort of thing, um, but um, it was, as advertised, extremely busy. We just popped over there basically just to see what it was all about and the answer is it's 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 about lots of people <laughs> and uh we actually came up into the starbucks up here and uh, hung out there for a bit and just watched sort of people watched from up there it's a really good vantage point and uh just enjoyed watching the flow the ebb and flow of people uh that looks like you know, just a never-ending tide, um, and it looks like total chaos, but of course it is, you know, reasonably well organized, um, and, uh, yeah, it was a fascinating experience just to, just to watch all that. So, again, this photo is out of my camera, so I don't have all that much to do here, but we will throw on the, the basics, um, as we've been doing, and I think actually that, that did do some good stuff for it. Oh yeah, that's way better. Yeah, that, it adds that gradient to the sky, and it just makes it look a lot, I don't know, nicer. Yeah, that was, that was actually a more substantial difference than I expected. Okay, um, <laughs> now this, uh, we didn't go to all these places in one day. This was, um, over the course of 
trying to think. Well, the the Pokemon Center was the same day as the Vampire Cafe, and then the next day we did Harajuku, and and then we went to Shibuya, and then we came uh, here uh, to Shinjuku. Uh, Shinjuku is um, a very um, uh, kind of. I got the sense that it was like a party district, you know, like uh, there were tons and tons of uh, pubs and restaurants and like uh, gambling places and um, some of it ranging from quite seedy uh, all the way up to like what looked like some pretty high end casino type stuff. Um, But this was sort of one alley that we happened to just turn down while looking for a a place to eat and uh it was just so colorful and so alive with whatever is going on here that uh it was just captivating this was a little bit seedier as you can see uh you know we've got uh advertisements for uh bikini girls bar over here um this is another like, girls 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 kind of thing going on um Oh, there was a robot restaurant. We didn't go into that one, but uh, that probably was fascinating. Um, honestly, we didn't go into any of these places, but we just kind of walked along and just like soaked up the ambiance, the the vibes of this place, this kind of crazy party district. I mean, it wasn't crazy in the sense that there were like, you know, we never felt unsafe or anything like that, but it was... It was somewhat chaotic, and there was a lot going on, and certainly a lot of colors and lights and all that. Um, But it was very cool, a cool vibe for sure. It seemed like a very trendy kind of place to be. Um, So, again, I I actually didn't realize that I chose so many photos coming out of my camera, or my phone, I keep saying that, my phone camera. Uh, But here's another one, so we'll just do what we've been doing. Uh, That's quite bright. It's quite bright. I don't actually want that much exposure. Um, And you know what? I don't even know if I want the heavy vignetting on that because it it kind of darkens the street too much. And honestly, one of the more interesting things in this photo is just all the, the variety of people. Uh, coming by here, so um, I feel like maybe we can bring this down a bit. Oh, too much, too much, but I felt like the blacks were a little too lifted um, and it was not giving us enough contrast, but that that's starting to look a bit more interesting to me. Um, maybe a little more clarity. Yes, okay. Yeah, that's doing some good stuff. There we go. Uh, that looks richer for sure. Whereas over here, a little more washed out. Um, and now we can actually maybe bump the exposure just a tad. Yeah. Bring those highlights down a little bit. Yeah, that's looking pretty neat. I love the colors. I love the colors there. Um, okay, now this, this photo's gonna need a lot of work. It might not be as salvageable as I'd hoped, but this, um, was, uh, um, a botanical garden, which, uh, the name of which is escaping me, but it's, it's just south of Shinjuku. This was the next day, actually, that we went to this garden. And, um, it was a, a beautiful botanical garden with, um, like garden styles from all around the world so not like just a Japanese garden but all kinds of stuff and um, uh, but this was a very gorgeous part with this lovely maple uh, leaning out reaching out over this this pond Um, now this looks pretty blown out and I I don't know how much exactly I'm going to be able to recover in terms of detail from this image but, you know, by default, this does not look that great, but I think, I have a feeling that it might be one that we can really, uh, you know, get a surprising amount out of. This is from my camera in RAW format, and so uh, that gives us a lot of bandwidth to work with here. So let's...
let's just uh, hit some of those basics and boom, we've already got quite a bit more uh, going on here. Maybe not quite as much as I hoped, but, you know, still quite a bit more than we did. Um, what do we need? I feel like... I don't know, we're still lacking something here. Maybe a bit more warmth for starters. So it's a fairly nice day. A bit more of that sunlight vibe. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe we're not going to be able to do, get quite as much out of this as I'd hoped. That sharpening really did help actually there, which is nice. And putting this vignetting in will probably help with the sky a bit here, but it's just so blown out that there's only so much we can do. Even here, uh, you know, in Lightroom with the raw photo. Overall, I don't know that I'm quite as happy with this as I'd hoped I would be. Um, you know, it's a vast improvement over the original, like no doubt. It's way better. Actually, now that I put those side by side, it, it, it definitely is an improvement, but maybe not quite as much as I'd hoped. I do have another uh, photo that's nearly this exact same shot, but just taken with my phone camera, which does have an auto HDR function built in, which really helps in these very high dynamic range situations in order to capture detail um, from, you know, both the bright brightest areas and the shaded areas and I think that picture turned out a lot better than this one truth be told but you know uh, I still think this one's all right now that we've tweaked it a little bit it's okay it's a very pretty spot uh, I just don't know that this photo quite does it justice okay <laughs> we must be getting close to the end here yeah we're a few photos away that was just good because good lord I am ready for bed um, this was a fantastic art installation, a fascinating interactive art installation called Team Labs Planets. I don't want to give away too much of it, uh, so I will say if, if any of you are planning on going to Tokyo, 1000% go to Team Labs Planets and maybe skip to the end of this video because I don't, again, I don't want to spoil it all for you, but, uh, it was a a heck of an experience. Um, and this was one of the exhibits. Um, I don't know what to say about it other than the fact that it was a bunch of glowing foggy eggs uh, outside <laughs> in a misty moss garden, uh, which sounds like such a weird descriptor, but that's exactly what it was. And uh, it was, it was uh, weirdly beautiful. Um, this is a raw photo, so we can do a bit of work on it here. Um, this is going to lift the shadows a lot, probably. Oh yeah, that's too much. Uh, so let's back that off a bit. I don't mind getting a bit more detail in the shadows than we had initially, but that was just too much. Um, but let's do that, and then let's... Uh, I don't know that we really want to sharpen this. There's nothing that we're going to really gain by sharpening, and it's already pretty noisy. It's pretty dark, so uh, let's just throw on some vignette. And uh, a little before and after. Yeah, I'm not sure that really did that much. <laughs> it's looking pretty similar before and after, except for just being way more vibrant. But uh, that's all right. That's all right. I'm kind of, you might have noticed, uh, picking up the pace here because I need to, uh, you know, get to bed. But this is amazing for starters. This is pretty hard to explain what's going on here. So in this room, it was a room where all the walls and floor were made of mirrors and hanging from the ceiling were orchids. So, so many orchids, a sea of orchids, and not just hanging statically, but they were undulating. These were undulating waves of orchids. The whole place 
uh, smelled of flowers and it was just this absolutely overwhelming um, assortment of orchid flowers. Uh, this picture, uh, just to give you some orientation here, is standing looking across this room of flowers and up a little bit slightly towards the ceiling. You can just make out amongst the flowers some of the scaffolding in the ceiling here. Um, but of all the amazing exhibits at Team Labs Planets, this might have been my favorite. It was a truly uh, phenomenal experience, unlike anything else I've ever done. And they are live orchids. These are not plastic. These are real live orchid flowers. It was just overwhelming and just impossibly beautiful. Um, there's also some really gorgeous music playing at the same time, like ambient kind of music. Um, this, of course, uh, once again came out of my phone camera, so not a whole lot to be done here, as far as I can tell. Um, but just uh, slap a couple, a couple of those on there and uh, do a little comparison. Yeah, I mean, the vignette adds a little bit of, a little bit more depth. Um, otherwise, it's already a pretty darn amazing photo, uh, especially with context. It's, it was, yeah, just thinking back, back to it just gives me goosebumps. It was such a cool thing. Okay, so this was down, uh, Team Labs Planets was down by the water, um, on, I don't know the name of the harbor there, but, uh, sort of the main big harbor there in Tokyo. And this was a photo I took. Uh, once we we left the Team Labs Planets, we went there in the evening. And so this was, uh, you know, maybe 9 or 10 p.m. And it was just uh, beautiful and calm down by the water there. And uh, this is a raw photo, so we have, we have a fair bit of bandwidth to play with here. Again, I don't know that there's that much, so we need to do with it, but what we could do is maybe a little bit of that AI-based noise removal, just to see oh. pardon me, how it performs here. Um, so let's do that. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Where did we get to? We did this, we did that. Uh, let's do that. Sure. It brightens it up more than it needs. But it did some good things, I think, as well. Let's say there. And um, let's maybe straighten it a little bit too. No, I don't necessarily agree with what it did there, so forget about it. <laughs> Um, let's add a, a medium vignette, uh, just to add a little more gradient to that sky. And let's do some heavy sharpening because it is actually quite soft. Now most of that softness comes from the graininess. You can almost certainly see just how grainy and noisy uh, all these dark areas like the night sky are. Well, everything for that matter. So this is where this AI-based image denoising is such a godsend. Um, and we just hit that button there and uh, you can get a little preview here of how it is going to look after the denoising and you can see so when I'm moving it around like this that's showing the default noisy image when I let go that's the AI uh, noise re reduced preview so let's uh, hit that enhance it's going to take a second to uh, do that enhancement and uh, generate us a fresh copy here and just like that all that noise out of the sky. These apartment buildings, so much more detailed. Everything just looks so much cleaner. Um, it's honestly kind of like magic. Uh, and this is sort of a best case scenario, you know, with this big sky and all that. It was all gritty to start with, but uh, 
that's a really cool shot. I actually really like that one, and I think that even if the colors are not that much different than the original, that noise reduction um, has done incredible things. And um, actually, it occurs to me because this is a copy already. Um, when it does the AI noise reduction, it creates a copy of the image, and so in this before and after comparison, they're basically the same image because this is just the image before we did the, the denoising. So it's not actually comparing it against the original original there. But I like I like that picture. Oh, and then and then that's it. Then we're leaving Tokyo. So um, yeah, we were there for I guess it was more like five and a half or six days uh, initially. And then at the end of the trip, we did actually come back to Tokyo for um, a couple of days. But we did. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, guys. Hopefully you find all my yawns relaxing. <laughs> we did come back uh, for a little bit, but most of our sightseeing we did the first, uh, the first week or so that we were there. And, um, you know, there's lots of stuff we did and saw that I did not include in those photos, but again, in the interest of time, I, I thought I had better uh, just, um, you know, just pick some of those highlights. Um, this is a pretty boring looking photo, except for one thing. Can you spot it? Can you see what it is? This was taken from the train, the Shinkansen, which is a, a very high-speed train. goes about 300 kilometers an hour. Uh, we took the Shinkansen from Tokyo uh, to uh, Kanazawa on the western side of Honshu. And uh, that will be something that I cover in a future video if you all enjoyed this and if you would like to see more of these photos and more of my ramblings. Um, but, uh, on that train ride, I saw in the distance a pretty iconic sight, and there it is. Uh, you might be able to see it very faintly in the distance, Mount Fuji. Um, and this was unfortunately actually the closest I ever got to it on this trip, the best shot that I ever got of it. But, uh, this is a great opportunity to really, um, abuse this photo a little bit because Lightroom is very powerful and um, if we want, if we want, uh, we can definitely come on in here and uh, really make Mount Fuji pop. So let's try that. Let's see if we can get it to come out of the fog there, come out of the mist. Um, and. Uh, and uh, really show itself. Now this is where, you know, this is where one could argue I am uh, manipulating this photo past the bounds of reality. Uh, you know, with the naked eye, it was certainly visible, but um, not as visible as I'm gonna try and make it here. So let's see, let's bring down those highlights. Oh, that was exposure, but that actually does help a fair bit. <laughs> Uh, and the highlights are already actually quite a ways down, but if we bring them a little further, if we bring these whites down a bit, there, and that starts to help. And then our secret weapon for uh, bringing this uh, out of the, the fog is our dehaze slider. Watch this. As we crank that, my goodness, suddenly... Now Fuji emerges from the mists. Now this is not the best ever <laughs> image of Mount Fuji, and I will say, you know, it's it's pretty grainy, but we do have that AI noise denoiser uh, that uh, is, I think, going to go a long way here. Um, now, in doing this, we have, of course, done crazy weird things to the sky and all these buildings, but that's the price that we pay uh, in order to um, bring this mountain uh, out a little bit. So let's uh, let's slap on our heavy sharpening on top of our very grainy photo, and 
uh, that vignetting, which will really help draw your eye into the mountain there. And then uh, let's let's make this happen with with the AI denoise. I think it's going to come out looking pretty amazing. So we'll apply the same amount as before, 60 or maybe even a little more. Let's try 70%. How's that look? Mm, just great. Just great. And I'll think about it for a moment. And there is our denoised image. Now, maybe I went a little hard on the denoiser. Some of this is starting to have a bit of that painted look slightly, but I think from back here, I think from back here, that's pretty incredible, uh, considering, you know, how faint it was to start with. The fact that mountain is very clearly visible, we can make out the details of the snow on the upper slopes, um, and these amazing layers of landscape. Uh, it's just so picturesque, and we have this very dramatic sky as well. Now, again, some people might argue, you know, this is sort of stretching reality, but I, I think, you know, in select situations, it's fun to do something like this and get a really dramatic photo, which is, I think, what uh, we've accomplished here. So that is where I'm going to leave things off, my friends. Um, wow, this was a much longer video than I anticipated, and I rambled a lot more than I thought. And hopefully I didn't go too hard on the Lightroom stuff. Hopefully I included enough interesting little tidbits about some of the stuff I did there, and the things I saw. But there's just so much to talk about. I could talk uh, way more. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, you yeah, know, hopefully this was at least enough of a taste. But if you would be interested in another video like this, or several more like this, like I said, there's thousands of photos for me to work my way through, and, um, you know, I, I still spent a bunch of time in Kanazawa, and then a bunch of time down in Kyoto as well. Um, and I've got ample photos from each of those places, so I would love to you along on that photographic journey if you're interested in more of this in the future. So please do let me know if that's the case. Feel free to drop a comment or uh, share with me your experiences uh, traveling, especially if you've been to Japan. I'd love to, to hear um, about your your Japan travel experiences too down in the comments. And uh, a big, big big thank you uh, to our amazing supporters who selected this topic for today's, today's video. I appreciate their patience with me getting this out pretty late, and also uh, for their, their enthusiasm for, uh, you know, hearing about this trip and seeing some of these photos. And now, dear friends, I am off to sleep before I fall asleep here recording this video. I hope you, too, can get a good sleep if you are in fact, trying to sleep. Um, but uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look very forward to having you back here next time. Farewell for now, my friends. Hey, it's that part of the video where I give a big thank you, a special thanks, if you will, to this channel's amazing supporters on Patreon and YouTube memberships. It's really kind of them to support what I do here, and I appreciate it a whole heck of a lot. I also appreciate those in the Foos Row and Foos Row Da tiers who voted for this video topic, because despite the fact that I was sort of falling asleep <laughs> as I recorded, uh, I still really enjoyed it. And uh, hey, you know, I, I am very grateful and privileged to have the opportunity to share uh, my travels um, with all of you. So, uh, big shout out to everybody listed here. There is one particular tier amongst these fine people the one particular deer that gets their names read out in a special spoken shout-out in every single video. I bet you know what deer that is. 
yeah, you got it. It's the Foos Roda tier. And it is my great privilege, my great honor to read their names to you right now. Starting with Captain Vanquisher, Ragnar, Ragnarsson. We're going to jump over to the bottom of the next list, the Patreon Foos Roda list, just to mix things up. So we're going to Odin Sun. K Time, Jake Lofney, Rango Steel, and last but certainly not least, in fact, first, if we're reading this in the conventional way, Drummer Brit. I try to mix it up so that everybody gets their moment in the spotlight. I randomize the order of the names every, you know, couple of weeks and all that good stuff. Same goes for all of the others here, actually, the ones that I am not reading, but the ones that you see displayed. Now, this is very important. Listen closely, dear friends. If you've made it to this point in the video, I suspect, or at least I hope, you enjoy the videos that I produce, and if you would like to continue, or if you would like to support uh, the continued uh, production and creation of said videos, uh, beyond just, you know, watching and, and liking and commenting and all that stuff, which I do appreciate very much, but if you would like to contribute some money <laughs> towards uh, the continued production of these videos and support what I do that way. Well, now is your opportunity. <laughs> I do have a Patreon and YouTube memberships, as you probably gathered. There are links below in the video description. Hey, check them out. Maybe you'll like what I've got on offer there, like early access to my weekend videos, voting in a monthly poll to select a video topic, and of course, the special spoken shout out that you just heard. Once again, a big, big thank you to our amazing channel supporters. <laughs>